Wordsworth. You have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth, a crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature who has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. I exist. And if I speak one thought out loud, that thought exists, even after I'm shoveled into my grave. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth! Delusions! The Bible! Poetry! Essays! All kind, all of an opiate to make you think you have a strength when you have no strength at all! You have nothing but spindly limbs in a dream, and the state has no use for your kind! Yeah, well, we're gonna have to do something about that. This is RiverWestRadio.com, community-supported radio, streaming live from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm your host, my name is Michael Wordsworth, and welcome to Breaking Down the News, the show that presents the news highlights of the week, but with a twist. Breaking Down the News is more concerned in bringing you information that wasn't covered on the front pages. Headlines you don't want to miss, because not listening could be dangerous to your freedom, liberty, and health. Let's break down the news. Good afternoon on this Friday edition, May 11th of 2012. I'm Michael Wordsworth. Listeners are welcome to call in on any of the topics being covered today. The number to call is 414-935-2951, and the phone lines are open now. I went through so much mind blowing, pardon me, blowing news this week. Mind blowing. See, my mind got blown by the news. That I had a very difficult time deciding what to put on this broadcast today. It was as if the corporate media made a jigsaw puzzle out of all the truly relevant news stories and scattered the box all over the world. And I was going around searching the internet for each little piece, each little gem that contained more impending information than the next. Listen, all these stories are important, but this story, this story on Fukushima makes all the other stories seem far less impending. I covered Fukushima three times last week, and I wanted to lead out with something different, but I just had to make this the top story again. I'm talking about the northern hemisphere of the planet, Earth, being covered by nuclear fallout if another disaster happens at that power plant. Remember the catastrophe at the nuclear power plant in Japan last year? You haven't heard much about it lately, have you? Not in the mainstream news? And you would think that such an imminent threat would make the front pages. If this had, this would have been the headline. Okay, Japan could melt down, making half the earth uninhabitable. That would be the headline. Reactor number four continues to be a threat to the entire northern hemisphere should another catastrophe occur at Fukushima. What could set it off? Another earthquake, another tsunami, or the thing could just melt into itself and explode. These rods are exposed. They're sitting 100 feet in the air, just waiting to go nuclear. So far, little has been done, and no mainstream media coverage can be found on this huge story except for one article from the Washington blog. It was reported by Washington blog that U.S. Senator Ron Wyden personally went to Fukushima and declared the site an eminent threat to the safety of the United States. Aside from Washington blog, there was a little mention on MSNBC about Ron Wyden visiting it, and Reuters did a couple of articles. But that was it. We're going to do a Google search together later on in the show, and I'm going to show you just how odd this is. Like, After telling you how impending a disaster we have looming on the horizon here, you would think that this would be in the top story, but I don't know, maybe the mainstream media doesn't want to scare us anymore. It's uh, hard to say where their heads are at. So anyhow, here, uh, I'm going to Google Fukushima in the news. You can do this at home with me as well. You're on the internet now, so if you're listening to this show, check these stories out with me. Just don't take my word for it. It's even better when you yourself go and look this up all right just open another tab or window on your browser and find google news the show will keep playing in the background if you don't close riverwestradio.com you have to be in google news though search news to do this with me okay now type in fukushima this is our first test i'm going to show you that the 
mainstream media doesn't have this link to this keyword. It should be right there, Fukushima, disaster. But Fukushima, by the way, is spelled F-U-K-U-S-H-I-M-A. All right, type that into the Google News search bar, hit uh, search news, and watch what comes up. All right, we have a dog in the house. <laughs> Riverwestradio.com is being broadcast here right on Center Street, and we are open to the public, so eh, anything could happen, anything, as long as it doesn't happen what I'm talking about here. So, okay, now you got the Google News up, and what do we have here? The New York Times has an article about nationalizing the power plant. If you notice, the Ottawa Citizen is reporting the same thing. Japan to take over Fukushima plant. Big deal. That won't stop anything. The thing could blow any day. What does it matter who owns the damn thing? Japan needs to call upon all the world's resources to solve this problem, not change ownership. Yeah, if the entire northern hem hemisphere becomes uninhabitable, history is going to look back and say, I'm glad they at least nationalized the plant before it destroyed half the world. Okay, now notice that just below those articles, check out what the Japan Times is reporting in, in, the, same, in the same search list. This is great. Fukushima Resort to tap spa for own power. Revival pitch. This is from the Japan Times one day ago. A group of baby boomer residents from a spa resort section of the city of Fukushima is aiming to restore the area's popularity. Restore the area's popula popularity? Okay, it's not going to be too popular if that entire region melts down. Now, scroll down the page and we see this article. Fukushima, farmers plant rice, pray... Two, hey, praying at this point wouldn't hurt, but I don't think we should be so bold as to expect God to fix this problem. Historically, divine intervention isn't in the cards for this type of situation. I mean, remember Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Chernobyl, the Three Mile Island crisis of the 70s here in America? No intervention. The Japan Times says that Farmers have started planting rice in Fukushima Prefecture despite lingering consumer fears over radioactive follow-up from the nuclear crisis. Tainting local, tainting local. Listen, lingering consumer fears. I have this report from a Japanese newspaper called the Fukushima Diary reporting on May 10th that Koyochi Oyama, a member of the city council of Mina Misomama, pardon me, Mina Misoma, in the prefecture of Fukushima, it's a little area, a little county in the area of Fukushima. Fukushima, I guess, is like a county. Has measured unusually high levels of cesium-134 and 137 in the soil of his city. Soil samples were analyzed by the Mina Misoma government and found to be 122 times more contaminated than the mandatory evacu evacuation zone in Belarus, north of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. 122 more times. Cesium causes cancer in the liver, kidneys, pancreas, and other organs. It is particularly dangerous when it is in the soil and ends up in food. In March, it was reported that the cesium was detected in plankton, the little sea creatures and the, you know, those little guys, plankton. It was reported that cesium was detected in the plankton 600 kilometers east of the Fukushima facility, according to a Japan-U.S. joint research team. Now, that's because of all the water that was leaked out into the ocean directly from the plant. Of course, it's contaminated with cesium, strontium, radium, it's a whole host of things. And it is nice that these people are praying, but I wouldn't plant there for another 10,000 years or so. But now let's check out the real news found in mainstream media news sources, but buried. There should have been on, I mean, Ted Koppel or whatever should have been coming on your uh, nightly news and telling you, hey, 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 the world needs to get together and do something about this. There's a media blackout, and I'm going to prove to you that it in fact exists, this blackout I speak of. Now, please type into the search bar for Google News. We didn't find anything under Fukushima, but now we're going to type in Ron Wyden visits Fukushima. Wyden is spelled 
W Y D E N. That's Ron R O N Wyden visits Fukushima. And when you click search Google News, the top story is from Reuters. You got basically two stories there with a little link under it that says see all 216 articles. We're going to talk about that. And what immediately from Reuters, they report on April 16th, 2012. Spent fuel rods need to be moved to safety, says Wyden. Urges Japan to accept help. Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, said U.S. Senator Wyden on Monday, is a potential imminent threat. It is a safety to our nation. And then right below it, from MSNBC.com, Senator calls for U.S. help in Fukushima cleanup. Clean up. Now wait, this is the real kicker. Notice that the link that says see all 260 news articles, it's a green link with green text right below the first two articles that came up from Reuters and NBC. Okay, click that all 216 articles link. You won't believe it. Click it. I dare you. When I click it, I get a new page that has the same two articles. Where are the 216 articles? What the heck? And look, what it says below these sa those same articles, the text reads, in order to show you the most relevant results, we, being Google, have omitted some entries very similar to those already displayed. Oh, that's nice of you. Thank you, Google. Ah, oh, if you'd like, you can repeat the search with the omitted results included. You know, I'd like to do that. So let, let's do that now. Click the link that says repeat with the omitted results included. Click that and see what happens. Only one other article article comes up. Where are the 260 omitted articles? This isn't a conspiracy. This is negligent journalism. Possibly an intentional media cover-up. Well, we broke it here first. I'm breaking down the news. And the headline reads, today, Google links submit 216 articles from Search Engine News. Now, aren't you glad you tuned in? Nothing like finding out about the latest impending disasters have been omitted from the news and then going about your day as if it doesn't matter. Don't you just get a rush off that? Mmm, I can just feel that denial. Like a lukewarm opiate just washing away all my sensibilities and frustrations. No worries, calm, tranquil denial. You know, I think I just might do some shopping. That's what George Bush told the media after 911. Just go shopping. You know, I would, but I'm so broke, the only thing I can do is pay attention to the news, the real news, the alternative news networks that bring us the actual freaking news. What's the media hyping today? Another underwear bomber. Yeah, and you know, in spite of all this, uh, what, what do we have? I did a report on the FBI interview uh, last week as well, showing that the FBI continues, uh, that was from the New York Times, where they were saying the FBI continues to congratulate itself, celebrating the, the foiled terrorist plots that it instigated. Uh, and today, uh, because a lot, of, a lot of us, we find that the American memory only seems to last six months uh, every six months they can kill the new al-qaeda leader uh the new second in command it, it just doesn't matter so uh six months ago we had the underwear bomber they got to keep it fresh in our consciousness i mean this is the whole reason why we're experiencing a loss of civil civil liberties and why we got the tsa in the airports and they want to put them on the streets molesting our children going into a uh, uh, World War II veterans. I mean, those guys, that, that disgusts me the most. You got World War II veterans at the airport getting shook down by the TSA. They're in wheelchairs. They're old men. They got their purple hearts on them. One, one, one time they were visiting, they were having a Veterans Affairs joint meeting again and uh, a reunion. And this guy, the very thing that he fought the Nazis for, you know, do you remember the Nazis from at least movies or books or something? I know it's history, so it might be a little far in some people's memories. The television, if it doesn't tell you, you might not know. So we, we got to tell you now that your grandparents, my grandparents, they went over to World War II. They fought the Nazis. The Nazis were the guys that were papers, please. Can I see your papers? Uh... Uh, where are you going? What are you doing? Listening and spying on you. Uh, 
And then here we got them at the airport being uh, shook down. Well, it's all under the, the, the new terrorism. I mean, boy, we survived the Cold War, World War I and World War II, and we didn't need all this nonsense, these TSA and all this spying on our phone calls. And, of course, we didn't have emails back then, but same thing, our letters. And uh, the media... Here we go. We have another underwear bomber, this guy apparently out of Yemen. And again, the CIA, not the FBI, has foiled its own plot. I, you know what? I, I bet you can get all 216 related new, news articles on that story. <laughs> Terrorism, the new buzzword for giving up your rights as a citizen. You know... Mega corporations have become a far greater threat than terrorism ever could be because in the name of big business We have been placed in the crosshairs of not just a nuclear Apocalypse, but also the disastrous effects of self-replicating genetic pollution known as GMOs Big Pharma the pharmaceutical companies Merck Pfizer. They have brought us antibiotic resistant superbugs Big Agra gave us the global pollution of crops and soils with synthetic pesticides, the death of the honeybees, and the medical industry gave us mass poisoning of children with mercury through dentistry and vaccines. Isn't that wonderful? We poison our children with mercury through vaccines. And uh, governments told us that nuclear power was safe. Yet here we are in 2012 on the verge of an event that could kill a quarter of the human population on the planet and all the scientists can do is deny any problem exists at all. You know, we're living in the land of denial, led by elected denialists who are voted into office by working class denialists. Denial has become our modus operandi, our fabric of fairy tales. It's allowed our citizens and our civilization to ride high on a global debt pyramid, and it will be the harbinger of our ultimate destruction at the hands of scientists who promised us life but delivered us unto death. I'm Michael Wordsworth. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. We'll be back in a minute. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. Good afternoon. If you're listening out there because you tuned into RiverWestRadio.com to see what's playing today, well, this is Breaking Down the News. I'm Michael Wordsworth, and the number to call is 414-935-2951. This might be a small news talk show on an obscure River West radio network, but we are a worldwide broadcast, and the stories covered here are mighty indeed. We're the David against the Goliath of corporate media giants that essentially operate under the control of an elite cabal, a global olig oligarchy, hell-bent on bringing in a global government and a one-world currency. We're headed for a rough ride in the near future, as if it wasn't already bad enough for some of us. I'm telling you, it's going to get worse. I want to open up, I wanted to open up the show covering the actual agenda to make it worse, so I can show you what I'm talking about. It's the United Nations agenda, and it's called Agenda 21. Very few people have heard of it, but those who have are greatly alarmed, and it is in writing, and plain as day once you see it. But you have to look to see. I can tell you, but that won't make you realize that this is actually real and is taking place all over the country today. I'm going to read excerpts from Rosa Kaur's book, Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21, in a bit, which explains the incredibly complex issue in great detail and gives accounts from her personal experiences as a forensic commercial real estate appraiser specializing in eminent domain valuation. Her nearly 30 years of experience analyzing land use and property value enabled Rosa to recognize the planning revolution sweeping the nation. While fighting to stop a huge redevelopment project in her city, she researched the corporate, political, and financial interests behind it and found UN Agenda 21. Rosa speaks out across the nation as a regular blogger on her website, Democrats Against Agenda 21. We're going to cover more on that, Agenda 21. I brought with me her book, and I'll be reading excerpts from it. I'm inviting callers to call in. I know this is a 
difficult subject when you call in on topics that you're not these are new topics so very few of you would hear about them uh, at least call in on the fukushima i mean give your uh, opinion or advice uh, let me know that somebody's listening out there and this matters to someone that's that that in itself just call in and say you know what this does matter i'm listening and i'm going to tell a few people that's where it starts it starts with you and me gandhi said be the change you want to be or see apologize for screwing up gandhi's quote be the change you want to see so that's what we need to do we need to stay informed turn off those tv sets for two seconds take note of what's actually going on i'm michael wordsworth this is breaking down the news we'll be back in a minute you're listening to riverwestradio.com <laughs> Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Egypt's Sinai Peninsula is now kind of a wild west for militants opposed to the Jewish state. Netanyahu and the Israeli government have accused Iran of aiding and abetting the unrest in the Sinai. Despite Israel's assertion that militants pose a threat in the Sinai, the real threat is between Israel and the military government in Egypt. In April, Obama, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton received intelligence that Egypt and Israel are close to war, according to Debka Files. From Natural News, we find shocking new research reveals that a specific type of lung cancer many smokers develop comes from teeny tears in their lung tissue caused by microscopic glass fibers also known as glass wool, found in many conventional cigarette filters. These rips in the soft tissue fuel the development of tumors and cancerous cells due to the constant overload of toxins, namely pesticides, nicotine, and ammonia, contained in commercial cigarette smoke. A research team reviewed the damaged lung tissue of several cigarette smokers and said the x-rays looked identical to those patients exposed to asbestos. And that diagnostic imaging revealed what looks like ground glass, which settled in the soft tissue near the bottom of the lungs. The interviewed nurse on this research team said when lung tissue is damaged over and over, it develops lesions and the cancer plants itself in there like seeds. Natural News can now confirm that the Michigan Department of Natural Resources has, in total violation of the Fourth Amendment, conducted two armed raids on pig farmers in that state, one in Kalkaska County at Fife Lake and another in Cheboygan County, staging raids involving six vehicles and ten armed men. DNA conducted unconstitutional, illegal, and arguably criminal armed raids on these two farms with the intent of shooting all the farmers' pigs under a bizarre new invasive species order that has suddenly declared traditional livestock to be an invasive species. May's NATO summit in Chicago is still weeks away, but residents of the Windy City can expect to see armed federal agents patrolling the streets in preparation much sooner than that. Three weeks before international heads of state will converge in Chicago, Illinois, for the annual NATO conference, the U.S. Federal Protective Service will send armed officers into the city's downtown district to prepare, to prepare for the swarm of protesters expected to arrive in time for the event, slated for May 20th and 21st. Both the NATO and G8 summits were initially scheduled to occur back-to-back -to -back in the major Midwest city, but the meeting between the world's eight leading economies has since been re relocated to Camp David, the fortified presidential retreat in Maryland, used as a getaway destination for many of America's past commanders-in-chief. As of now, however, the NATO summit will take place in Chicago and, citing concerns over how demonstrators may respond, law enforcement is being called in early to size up the city. There's also another thing regarding this uh, summit. I read uh, on the last broadcast about H.R. 347. It's the new bill that the president and Congress has passed that basically says anybody covered under Secret Service protection 
at that point and on those premises, anywhere in America, citizens cannot protest. This is very, very interesting because with the NATO summit coming uh, in place in Chicago, there's going to be protest. There typically is, and people have a right. They, they protest the NATO, they protest the World Trade Organization, the World Trade Federation. And this is definitely one of those situations where you have foreigners coming into America under the guise that we're going to work this out, get along better, and make everybody money. No, it's not going to happen like that. They're going to have their meeting. People are going to show up and rightfully protest. And this time, we might find something really interesting at this particular event on May 20th and 21st. That's coming up real soon. We're going to see if uh, people get arrested and detained for just merely showing up to protest. But it gets even worse because there's going to be a situation where the, uh, um, the city is going to possibly be evacuated. I don't know if you heard anything about this, but there's supposedly uh, evacuation orders and preparations were given for the nearby businesses downtown and were given for the uh, local community college. Uh, several colleges are down there. And uh, it, evacuating Chicago that's an unsettling thought. I mean, what a big city. Where would you go? Where would you put these people? There's only so many routes out of there. And what would it be that you would need to evacuate the city? Are, are they saying that, you know, potentially we're going to have a horrible, horrible uh, terrorist attack? Or, or maybe uh, the new American Al-Qaeda, where U.S. citizens who are disgruntled with their tax laws and oppressive police state laws are going to actually uh, 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 be declared dissidents and, and troublesome. <laughs> we'll find out. This is going to be interesting. I, I got to pull up that article about evacuating the uh, Chicago area and go into that in greater detail. I'll give you the news sources on that so you can check it out yourself. But actually, just go into Google News, type in uh, plans to evacuate Chicago. That should bring it up. Uh, we'll see. Uh, continuing on with the news, we have tech giant Mozilla, the one company that makes that little browser with the Firefox guy on it, little icon. Well, Mozilla has publicly slammed the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, known as CISPA, which replaced SOPA. Uh, SOPA didn't do too well, but now we've got CISPA, which passed the House last week, labeling, labeling the legislation as an alarming threat to privacy. Now, the statement, that statement in particular is important because it marks the first time any Silicon Valley entity has denounced CISPA with an array of powerful companies lining up in support of the legislation, which passed the U.S. House of Representatives, 248 to 168 opposed, and now heads to the Senate. I'm Michael Wordsworth. We're still hoping that uh, we're going to be on the air for quite a while today, which is awesome. Apparently, things have been going well. We got our feet wet with the last, first uh, three shows, and we're really developing the format. But basically, we're a talk news hour that's now looking like two hours today, which is awesome on this Friday, May 11th, 2012. I'm really looking forward to this. What would, what would definitely help is we had some callers call in. You know, you can make a comment about any topic, at least I guess as long as it's news-related and uh, economy-related. Uh, tell me how your, how your job searches are going. Uh, let me see here. No, no. It's kind of funny because the video store that we're broadcasting out of, they have a telephone too, and it rings, and so sometimes I think... Uh, Maybe, maybe it's us. <laughs> nope, it wasn't us. All right, well, that's important. <laughs> I just had to check that out. All right, we're going to take a little station identification. When I come back, we're going to go over more news, more in-depth coverage of all the news that you should have heard about through the mainstream media but didn't. I'm Michael Wordsworth. This is Breaking Down the News. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. All right, we're back, and uh, 
Last week, I covered the issue of the FBI foiling their own plots. And I'd like to play the interview we conducted with the FBI. It's a bit of comedy, but it's actually relevant because we do quote Bloomberg and the New York Times uh, pretty well, and it pretty well expresses the situation with, the, with them. So we're going to go live with me at the FBI, FBI offices downtown. Take it away. We go to Michael. The FBI headquarters is a huge modern building in the middle of downtown. Cars and trucks drive past the front entrance on this very active street, and these doors will lead us to the elevators that will take us to the office of Deputy Director Hank Polarank. Welcome to the FBI headquarters. Can I help you? Yes, I have an appointment with Deputy Director Polarank. And your name is? Michael Wordsworth from RiverWestRadios.com, breaking down the news show. Michael who? No, no, the sorry, staff at the FBI was professional sure and courteous as they yeah, greeted me, and that. after a few security complications were smoothed out, I was soon uh, able to get in to do my interview. I'm Michael Wordsworth from Breaking Down the News. Hey, come on in, take a seat. And it was an interesting interview. How many terrorist plots has the FBI foiled in the last few years? Uh, we've been busy, very busy with ongoing investigations. It's hard to say off the top of my head. Ten, maybe twelve? And out of those ten or twelve incidents, how many of those were not terrorist plots instigated by the FBI? Oh, uh, none actually. Not one. Well, the underwear bomber, that wasn't us. But it came to light that the underwear bomber was forced onto the plane by a well-dressed man, and he didn't go through security. That wasn't the FBI. Uh, no. Might have been Secret Service. I think they handled that one. I'd like to quote an article from the New York Times. Can I? Uh, sure. Go ahead. This is an article by David K. Shipler, published April 29, 2012, and I quote, But all these dramas were facilitated by the FBI, whose undercover agents and informers posed as terrorists offering a dummy missile, fake C-4 explosives, a disarmed suicide vest, and rudimentary training. Suspects naively played their parts until they were arrested. When an Oregon college student, Mohammed Osman Mohammed, thought of using a car bomb to attack a festive Christmas tree lighting ceremony in Portland, the FBI provided a van loaded with 55-gallon drums of inert material, harmless blasting caps, a detonator cord, and a gallon of diesel fuel to make the van smell flammable. An undercover FBI agent even did the driving, with Mr. Muhammad in the passenger seat. Yeah. To trigger the bomb, the student punched a number into a cell phone and got no boom, only a bust. Terror. What do you say to that? What's your point? My point is it sounds like we really don't have a terrorism problem in America beyond those plots the FBI makes up itself. What? How did you get in here? Agent Smith. Be right in. What is it, sir? Hey, wait, how did you get in here? I, I don't believe this. He doesn't have clearance, sir. You'll have to come with me. He doesn't have clearance? How did he get past you? He snuck in here when I went to pay for the pizza delivery. I, I was there for a while. I wanted exact change. Okay, hey, thanks for the interview. That's all I need now. Sir, stop. Come back here. He doesn't have clearance? Thank you. Talk soon. You guys take care. Security, we have a gate jumper headed for the elevators. And whereas this interview did not yield all the answers I wanted, I did get to state my point. And as I was leaving the FBI building, I had the realization that making my point was worth the trip. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. And good afternoon. This is Breaking Down the News with Michael Wordsworth on Friday, May 11th, 2012. It's 4.10 p.m., and there's a beautiful day out there. I hope you're getting out and enjoying it rather than sitting here listening on the radio. 
Fortunately, you can listen to this because it's archived. If you go to riverwestradio.com, check the archives. On the front page, you scroll down just below the video. It says uh, May 7th to present, I believe. Click it in there, and you'll see the last four episodes of Breaking Down the News. Uh, before I get into Behind the Green Agenda, the UN Agenda 21, and uh, Rosa Quar, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. It's either Corey, Cor, Qua. Uh, it's spelled K O I R E. If you want to Google uh, Rosa, K O I R E. You'll find uh, she, she is really leading the forefront of this uh, bringing awareness about UN Agenda 21. And it's something that is the issue is so complicated. It, it, imagine a big green icky monster with thousands of tentacles stemming from the United Nations. And those tentacles are reaching into our communities and wrapping themselves around the throats of the city council. Well... It's insidious, and it covers so much, and it's affecting us so great that um, the, this is one of those things where when people have become aware and they went and challenged the meetings at the city council and voted against this, it actually helps. This is one thing where you can make a difference. The takeover is, and I'm speaking of the takeover of America, uh, through UN legislation, which is something that happens very slowly. It's often described that we're the frog sitting in the pot, as United States citizens are the frog, and we're becoming acclimated to the water because it's slowly heating up, but just enough where if it got too hot, the frog would jump out of the pot. I don't know if you've heard this analogy before, but that's the basic idea. The American public isn't jumping because it isn't burning their butts too bad right now. Tell you what, those gas prices dropped, and it's kind of amazing they did. We hit the summer, and usually gas prices go up somewhat, but they were doing all that Iran, uh, attacking the Straits of Hormuz and stopping the shipment of oil. And, you know, when it was all said and done, uh, I'm sure it made a lot of speculators some money on this oil, which is, you know, I'm not against anybody making money, but the very definition of terrorism is when you use uh, threats and violence to gain political gain and profit. I mean, this is essentially what the, the media and the government is complicit in doing. So I'm before I go into... Uh, Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21, and read excerpts from Rose's book. I wanted to cover some news articles that really cover the um, some of what I'm talking about. I mean, this is all related. It's not unrelated. It's completely related. And we're going to start off with this one. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre little, little blurb about uh, Minnesota. Mothers in Minnesota. Nice state. And I'm sure you know, everybody has a mother, so, you know, we... We have no problem when mothers bring us fresh, fresh food from local farms or free to feed us fresh milk, good food. What in America would make us where this is suddenly an issue? With all the issues we've got, we, we have to pick on mothers? Well, listen to this report from Mike Adams at naturalnews.com on May 11, 2012. He says, Minnesota moms threatened with criminal charges for distributing fresh food from local farms. And look, please... Any of these articles, call in and say, hey, I, I either agree or disagree with this point, or I think this or that. And it would definitely help. The number to call is 414-935-2951. And I'm going to read this article from Mike Adams about moms being threatened with criminal charges for distributing fresh food. The following announcement has been issued by the Raw Milk Freedom Riders. A call to action for Monday, May 14th, is also included below. The Minnesota government is taking its cue from California and declaring war on fresh milk. I mean, geez, you, you had the, this isn't the article, this is me now, but you, you had the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on war. I mean, that's kind of... <laughs> uh, uh, it seems like whatever they declare a war on, 
uh, ends up being just a disaster. And now we, we've got uh, California and Minnesota declaring war on fresh milk. My God. Threatening to throw moms in jail for providing fresh food to infants and families. Now, if that doesn't get you wondering what, what, what would, well, we have many more articles and they all keep us wondering, but uh, I'm going to cover this little Minneapolis, Minnesota, several Minnesota mothers who organize community access to local fresh farm foods. I mean, that could be just like the co-op or the uh, uh, outpost. You know, the, the people get together and they, they organize local fresh farm foods, plan to risk criminal charges by openly and publicly defined warnings from Minnesota Department of Agriculture. The Minnesota Department of Agriculture, or the MDA, has threatened several mothers. That just in itself is just, just ruffles my feathers, threatens mothers. I mean, what kind of pig would threaten a mother? Anyhow, conducting investigations against them and sent them warning letters that if they continue helping provide fresh food to their friends and neighbors, they will be subject to criminal charges and prosecution. The MDA alleges the mothers are violating food handling regulations. Mothers violating, I mean, has motherhood really slipped that far that they no longer how to know how to provide food in a sanitary, safe environment? I mean, when you go to the park with your family or have a barbecue at your house, is this a concern? Well, apparently it is now. I mean, this is, this is legislation going right into our home. Dozens of individuals who are disgusted with what they regard as MDA's overly aggressive tactics are expected to join in the same activity as these mothers. It is, and here's a quote. It is absolutely outrageous that during this time of economic crisis, our state government is investigating and sending warning letters to mothers and putting farmers on trial who are helping provide communities with fresh foods. It's my right to contract privately with a farmer for the food of my choice, just as it is the right of every American, says Melinda Olson, a mother and recipient of one of the MDA's nasty letters. The MDA's harassment against mothers will not work. We plan to ignore this warning and continue operating as we are. MDA should not waste taxpayer money investigating, prosecuting, and jailing peaceful farmers and mothers for helping their communities secure fresh foods. Our time to stand up against this tyranny is now, says Melinda, and I agree with her. Good for you. That's the thing is you have to question, you know, a being authority is is one thing i mean this is a, a law is a law and that's why we have them laws keep civilization peaceful and it, it allows us to go to court and settle this without bashing each other's heads in as as was the case centuries ago it's civilized to have laws but when laws get into the hands of tyrants or when we waste energy on on, on this type of thing you have to make it wonder what, what the heck how long is it before you can't wake up in the morning and go to work without breaking the law just by you're too poor to pay for everything well commuters uh part, pardon me customers and supporters from around the state and country have planned a rally for schlangen i hope i pronounced that right it's s-c-h-l-a-n-g-e-n -E on the first day of his criminal trial on monday criminal trial unbelievable may 14th at 7 a.m outside the minneapolis courthouse courthouse at the rally, supporters will sign a declaration of food independence. I mean, is that necessary? Is it? Re Apparently, it is. And demonstrate noncompliance against what they deem unjust regulations. The rea the rally is expected to draw hundreds, and well, it should. I mean, it probably draw thousands, but it's amazing. Well, the number to call is 414-935-2951. If that last article didn't... Uh, get your goat <laughs> didn't get your goat's milk i don't know i don't know what will uh let's let's see let's go to another article uh is is the food we eat killing us this one's by michael snyder from the economic collapse uh the economic collapse is a website i believe it's economic .com. let me double check that for you because uh I've gotten a few articles from these guys, and they, they really do have good stuff. 
Uh, yes, and it is actually uh, end of the American Dream dot com, where this article comes from. Well, hey, what are you going to do? From the economic collapse, Michael Snyder, Thursday, May tenth. He asked, is the food we eat killing us? And he begins his article by saying, are we digging our own graves with our teeth? Is the food that we eat every day slowly killing us? When I was growing up, I just assumed that everything in the grocery store was perfectly safe and perfectly healthy. I just assumed that the government and the big corporations were watching out for us and that they would never allow something harmful to be sold in the stores. Boy, was I wrong. Today, the average American diet is extremely unhealthy. Most of the foods that we all love to eat are absolutely packed with things that will damage our health. Many of the ingredients that make our foods taste good, such as fat, salt, and sugar, can be extremely damaging in large amounts. On top of that, most processed foods are absolutely loaded with chemicals and preservatives. The next time you go to the grocery store, just start turning over packages and read the ingredients that are being put into our food. If you have never done this before, you will be absolutely amazed. In many of our most common foods, there are ingredients that I cannot even pronounce. Sadly, most Americans have no idea that eating a steady diet of these processed foods will likely leave them massively overweight, very sick, and much closer to death. Eating healthy takes more time, more effort, and more money than eating poorly does. Unfortunately, most Americans are content to chow down on foods that are quick to make, and that tastes good. Hey, I can't blame, this ain't in the article, this is me here saying, I can't blame anybody for that. I mean, you, you want quick food and food that tastes good, but the price that we're paying here, it, it's a little more effort. It doesn't take too much. Uh, the prices of regular vegetables versus the right prices of organic vegetables and organic vegetables, if they are truly organic, should not have any pesticides in them. Of course, I read an article once saying that 30% of them were uh, uh, had perchlorate in them, which is a type of, uh, what is it, rocket or jet fuel? somehow used as a pesticide and it, so anyhow i mean sometimes you can't even trust the organic food it's it's not a given i mean it takes the vigilance of us and consumer watch groups to stay on top of this uh to continue with the article um in particular americans are absolutely addicted to foods that are loaded with sugar and high fructose corn syrup when you start looking at food product labels, you will find that either sugar or high fructose corn syrup is in almost everything. And that, that is so true. It's very difficult to buy things that do not have those two items in it. For example, I was absolutely amazed when I learned that most bread sold in our grocery stores contains high fructose corn syrup. Why in the world would they need to put that in our bread? Today, Americans are consuming far more sugar and high fructose corn syrup than ever before, and this has many health professionals very alarmed. The following is an excerpt from an article on the website of the Mayo Clinic. It states, some research studies have linked consumption of large amounts of any type of added sugar, not just high fructose corn syrup, to such health problems as weight gain, dental cavities, poor nutrition, and increased triglyceride levels, which can boost your heart attack risk. But it is not just sweeteners that are a concern. There are great concerns about much of the meat that we eat as well. Today, we grow animals much larger than we used to, but it comes at a price. For example, we pump our cows full of growth, growth hormones, and they stand around in piles of their own manure until it's time for them to die. I don't want my cow like that. If many, I, you know what? I eat the, the, the meat that's grass fed and it just isn't that much. It's like seven bucks for a package of the burgers. I'm not sure. I get like 1.2 pounds of it or something. It's enough for three good sized burgers, seven bucks. I mean, you really can't beat it. It's like a day or two's worth of meals if you do it right. And it's made here local in Wisconsin and grass fed. You can't go wrong. Uh, another dramatic change that's happened to our food supply in recent decades has been the rise of genetically modified crops, or GMOs as they're called. 
In this area, there has been nothing short of a revolution. In 1996, only about 2% of all soybe soybeans in the United States were genetically modified. Today, about 90% of all soybeans in the United States are genetically modified. 2 to 90%, that's a huge jump. <laughs> At this point, approximately 70% of all processed foods in our grocery stores contain at least one ingredient that has been genetically modified. And if you don't know why GMOs are such a problem, we're going to cover, it's another topic that we're going to cover extensively on this show. Uh, it's something that, like Fukushima, like our eroding civil rights, uh, like Agenda 21, we need to stay informed and on top of this. It doesn't take too much. I mean, people say, what can I do? Well, what? just don't believe the lie. I mean, understand that traditionally the government, the media, how many cases do I, I could get here on this show for two weeks straight and not run out of the litany of times mentioning wherein we were lied to? I mean, this is what I mean when I say American can be such a nation of suckers when it comes to this. It's like, you know, honestly, I know how it goes. You got your, your some of us don't have work. Some of us don't have homes. And for those who do have homes and still have jobs and uh, uh, some money in the bank and looking forward to maybe a trip to Europe or two or China, maybe the retired people, I understand when life is good, you really don't want to be bummed out thinking about all these negative things and the basic attitude becomes, well, what can I do anyhow? I, I can't really change things and they're just progressing out of my control and uh, what does it matter? And And, you know, the idea that if you somehow deny this information, you'll preserve your way of life. That's, that's what's ingrained into our heads right now, especially if you got money. I know I've done well before. I've had things and uh, a home, a car. And at that time, is, I was the least concerned about these issues. <laughs> I mean, honestly, life does feel pretty good when you're walking around in denial. There's a little high you get off of it. It's kind of like, oh, ha, ha, ha. I, I'm untouched by this and everything's fine. But you know what? Nothing in time and space is permanent. It's all temporal. <laughs> no government has lasted forever. No nation state has gone on. I think uh, the Byzantine Empire has the record for a thousand years. And arguably, I'd say that the Byzantine Empire was actually the old Roman Empire just repackaged, rebranded, and spread throughout Europe. And in a large sense, we're the new version of it here in the industrialized Western democratic nations. So anyhow, uh, I'd like to go on more and more the food this, this article goes on, but it, it's just amazing to see this. Uh, let's change from food for a second because, I mean, let's... It's, just, I don't want to be the, the one saying, look, uh, you, you need to eat your vegetables. You need to stop eating sugar. Get your sleep. I mean, this isn't, I'm not trying to be your nanny here. It's, I really don't care if you, you know, I believe it's your right to make your own decisions as an informed consumer, as an adult, you have the right to make your own decisions. So, and believe me, um, Changing your diet and your food, it, it takes a while. It's a lifestyle change. It doesn't happen overnight. And um, you can uh, got to give yourself a little bit of a break you know, when you're doing this. But it needs to be done. There's no way around it. We've become so ingrained with this. I mean, just think about all the sugar we eat. I cut out sugar not too long ago. And I, I just went in to grab a cup of coffee today. And I was looking at that cheese Danish going, ooh, Oh, you would be so good to eat before the show. I'd get my little sugar rush. So I'm doing this all without a sugar rush today. I've got caffeine, though, here in this coffee cup. And I guess, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not saying I am. I'm saying that change starts by little teeny steps. You, you want to, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. If you want to eat an entire elephant, you got to eat it one bite at a time. And this is when it comes to social change whether it's in our country or in another country, it has to progress gradually. Uh, sudden, rapid progression 
uh, whether it's good or not, can be very damaging to society and culture. It can wipe out society and culture. It can cause division between generations, uh, old and young, where the young don't listen to the old and the old don't listen to the young. And uh, that's basically the situation we've got now, but there's a reason for that one, too. Um, after the baby boomers, you basically had the first generations that knew things that their parents didn't. And I'm talking about mostly the computer and the internet. This is something where some baby boomer generation members participated, they, they gravitated, they embraced the new technology and they did very well. But what we had here, especially in Wisconsin, we had a situation where the older generation didn't like computers. My dad never liked computers, and I always wondered why. It was always an interesting thing, like, why didn't you like computers? I mean, they're obviously these wonderful things, and but he knew about the FEMA camps years ago, and he, off, he often and he knew that the Nazis, aided by IBM, uh, used the first punch card computer system to actually keep track of Jewish uh, citizens or rather, German-born citizens that were of Jewish descent. And as we all know, they suffered a horrible tragedy. I'm not a Holocaust denier. In fact, that's so preposterous. Without a doubt, there was an estimated 6 million members of the Jewish faith that were exterminated by the Nazis, but they weren't the only ones. Gays were exterminated. Uh, artists, intellectuals killed off political opposition members killed off. Uh, anyhow, th this story doesn't end. It keeps moving forward. It's called the history of humanity, and the story unfolds as in, right into our era and age, which is absolutely unprecedented. Never before have we been at this, at this position. I mean, even the Fukushima scientists were saying, uh, look, this is unprecedented. We, we, we've never had such an imminent threat. This isn't like an asteroid coming from space. We can't do much about that unless you send Superman out there or the Avengers to, you know, knock it off course. But Fukushima, mm, that's something that we, we did and can do something about. I hope uh, it doesn't look like anything's going to happen if we don't pay attention and start pushing and urging our politicians and legislators to get up off their butts and do something. But being aware is important and it's the beginning. I'm going to talk about this article from the American Dream, also by Michael Schneider, uh, talking about a Chinese group plans to construct a 200-acre China city in Michigan. Now, you would think maybe Michigan would need the help. I mean, Detroit, ever since the car industry collapsed, uh, Detroit has city blocks that have just been bulldozed over. I mean, those neighborhoods are gone. It's got, got to be, I've only seen pictures. I actually haven't been there to walk around, but I do have a friend that lives there, and he said it is bizarre. Imagine like uh, Milwaukee, and you just start taking out chunks of the city, chunks of blocks, and leveling them. So, you know what, to tell you the truth, actually, Milwaukee did look like that a lot in the 70s, the 1970s. I remember that. Or just sections of it were just... As the as the uh, expansion moved on, um, people moved out, and the city became. Uh, anyhow, anyhow, let me let me go on with this article. A Chinese group known as the Sino Michigan Properties LLC has bought up 200 acres of land near the town of Milan, Michigan. Their plan to construct a China city with artificial lakes, a Chinese culture center, and hundreds of housing units for Chinese citizens. Essentially, it would be a little slice of communist China dropped right into the heartland of America. Now look, clearly, I would welcome any people of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Taiwan descent to come to America. That's what America is about. You come here, you work hard, you have money, you buy up some land, you hold your own. It's a good good way of life. We actually provide power here. Uh, there's some good things that America does. If you're in India, you don't get power all the time. But in America, we can at least guarantee that for now. We'll see Obama's like heavily hitting the coal industry and the nuclear industry has the same problem that the Fuk Fukushima does. We're um, not using a, th a thorium-based plutonium uh, in our reactors. Well, unlike Iran, who is using a thorium-based uh, plutonium, which 
if you know anything about thorium, it can't be weaponized. And so if Iran uses this thorium-based plutonium, they're not building a bomb. But, oh, 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 that's another topic. You know, it's difficult to keep all these topics going. They are interrelated. This article I'm reading about this Chinese group uh, building a 200 acres China city in Michigan. This is actually part of the UN Agenda 21. I'm sure it's connected somehow, some way, and it's basically what I'm talking about. The point that I was going on, I welcome uh, people from other countries of any race, nationality, or creed coming here in America and doing what anybody here would want to do. You know what, you know what would be nice is if uh, you became citizens. I mean, could you imagine if... Uh, we started moving to Mexico or China and started building an American city and only Americans are going to live there. And it's just a matter of time, like, what are you doing? And believe me, I am not a xenophobe. A xenophobe is a fear of foreigners. It's an unreasonable fear, but I'm sure somebody had reason. And in the old days, foreigners would come in and they would colonize, uh, specifically the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the French Empire, and even China. You know what, China? They're all over Africa. Africa, the continent of Africa, is just one big divvied up section of resources where, you know, the, the only people that don't get to use Africa and its resources seems to be native-born Africans. <laughs> Continents belong to them for thousands, I mean, like thousands of years, and still they don't have control over it. Uh, Libya was Gaddafi, you could say what you want about the guy, but he was taking care of Libyans. He was going to nationalize the oil factory, and, and the people in Tripoli, when we attacked, they were actually supporting him. I mean, it was crazy. And now, guess who, guess who runs Libya? Al-Qaeda. They're flying the Al-Qaeda flag. Check that out. Mainstream media news. I mean, this is something that I just couldn't believe. I mean, we no boots on the ground. Obama didn't need any approval from Congress. It was going to be a NATO-based action, and uh, we were going to let fund and, and arm the Libyan rebels. Like, everybody in the Middle East, this is the, the propaganda they're always putting out. Oh, they're promoting democracy. In the name of democracy, as it, and then all the, the little Americans over here that are uninformed and decadent and lazy, they all go, yes, we love democracy. All the Arabs and the Persians and the Iranians, they, they should just accept our ways. What an arrogant, asinine attitude. I mean, really. How would you like it if somebody came over here and said, you know what? Your Christianity thing, it was doing well, but now I think you should adopt Allah. You should become Muslim. And, you know, if, if the Muslims had, uh, say, the switch, it, it was reversed. Say Iran or Iraq was the global world power, and their, their currency was the reserve currency for the world. Think about this. In America, would you really appreciate missionaries and emissaries coming over here colonizing our land and the same things we did to them? And, and you might say, Yes, but we're Americans and it's our empire, so ha. Huh? You know, most of you couldn't pick up. If you actually had to go to war, you wouldn't do it. That's the sick thing about it. I can't stand people that just hide behind this. Oh, were, were you in the army? Actually, I was in the army. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in the war, but I have friends and family that were. And if you actually go to war, if you actually are in the military in these situations, it, it's nothing nice. And, and for senators and generals and people to sit back thinking that, oh, yes, yes, America's number one. We're great. We need to sp spread our democracy. What, spread our fat food, fast food, McDonald's, Burger King? I mean, are you serious? You want everybody drinking Coca-Cola and uh, dying of diabetes, cancer, and heart attacks? Is that the great American dream? This is what we're seeking to spread and promote? Anyhow, I so digress, it's beyond digression. I'll continue with this article because it, it pertains to uh, this talk, takeover that I'm talking about. So essentially, it would be a little slice of communist China dropped right into the heartland of America. Oh, and by the way, remember, the number to call is 414-935-2951. That number is posted on the sign. If you go to riverwestradio.com, you'll notice that 
There's a little video caption there playing. It says breaking down the news and the numbers posted. There's also a new email if you feel uncomfortable about calling in, but you'd like to comment on any of the things I've said. I, and I don't care if you di- please disagree with me. God, I wish somebody would call in and just disagree. You know, I know it sounds fun. I mean, like people that call and agree are, are fine and everything. We we feel good about ourselves. Yeah. Oh, we're reinforcing, you know, even even me. You know, it's like, yes, it feels good to hear other people share their opinions that we agree on. But we're not going to get anywhere just by preaching to the choir. Uh, disagreement is good. Debate is good. The political process requires debate. And people don't want to talk about politics. I walk around going to bars, going to events. I want to talk about the news. I want to talk about politics. And it's something where you just don't talk about politics in a bar. I mean, that's, I guess, uh, the guy next to me said, you know, it's kind of a rule in Milwaukee. You don't talk about politics while you're at the bar. And I, I just took it that he meant when people are drinking, maybe it isn't the best time to talk about politics because definitely people feel heated. And I notice they feel the most heated, the most res- um, the most adamant about issues when they are ignorant of those actual issues. In other words, there's sort of a default position that people take when they they only know so much, they they only have so much time in the day. They can only stay so informed. So they kind of, as we grow older, we start to make policy. We don't uh, rely on facts anymore or look into things. We just settle policies. And I know from from experiencing myself, those policies. I forgot why I even made that policy. It's a situation. I only have so much brain power. I understand why my grandparents and my parents were this way too, growing up here in this community. It's a situation where just we have a policy for everything and an attitude for everything, and it kind of settles into Democrat or Republican. Um, and well, there's a downside to that. There is clearly a downside to just relying on policy because we're no longer dealing in the realm of fact. We're not discussing the issues, and then if we don't, uh, the issues will be decided for us, and that's exactly what, what, what would be happening. So this China City that I was speaking about earlier would be located about 40 minutes from both Detroit and Toledo, and it would be marketed to Chinese business people that want to start business in the United States. Unfortunately, this is just not an isolated incident. In fact, Chinese companies have been buying up land and businesses all over the country in recent years. There's even been talk of establishing special economic zones inside the United States. You know what? I'm going to stop this article right now because there is a special economic zone uh, in Arkansas. The country of Mexico has its own little uh, sovereign land where there's, um, through the NAFTA and CAFTA trade agreements, they've got their own little region that belongs to Mexico where they can bring in the, the slave goods made from China up through Mexico and they're distributed throughout the country. Uh, I guess if you can distribute that, you can distribute a few other things, which would... <laughs> Anyhow, uh, let me stay on topic here because... Um, uh, the town of Milan, Michigan, is a small farming community of only about 6,000 people, but big changes are coming their way. The following is from a re- recent Dayton Daily News article about this new project. A group of mainland Chinese known as Sino Michigan Properties LLC paid $1.9 million for 200 acres of farmland on Milan city limits and purchased this this year and in 2011, according to local officials and property records. Unfortunately, the goal does not appear to be appear to integrate this new city into the existing community in and around Milan. Rather, it appears that all of the new housing will be sold to people coming from over China, from China. According to the Milan New Leader newspaper, the new housing units would be marketed to Chinese business people who want to start companies in the United States. You know, I'm not against businesses coming to the United States. Again, this is this is not the uh, problem. In essence, we would be looking at a new Chinese city right in, in the middle of Michigan. The thing is, they're talking about that th- this, you know, when you come here, you still have to abide by our rules and regulations that hopefully were decided by a uh, representative government and that we had some referendum or some voting process that allowed us to 
say yay or nay on these things, but it sounds like this this case is not going to be the case. Uh, we're going to have a little chunk of China right here. Doug Smith, Senior Vice President for Business and Community Development for the Michigan Economic Development Corps, recently said the following about what the Chinese group plans to do. It's a group that wants to build a China city, starting with housing over there in Milan. Well, that wasn't such a big statement, but Milan is not far from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, which is very popular. This new project would be a Chinese community built by Chinese and specifically designed for Chinese. But isn't this supposed to be America? Fortunately, the project does not have final approval yet. It still must be approved by two townships outside of Milan where the land is located. For some reason, the Chinese seem to be particularly interested in this area of the country. I don't know, Michigan? I, don't ask me. I know we got some good ginseng here in Wisconsin, so, you know, and who doesn't like ginseng? But anyhow, for example, a different Chinese investment group has been buying up chunks of real estate over in nearly Toledo, Ohio. The following is from an article in Toledo Blade. So here's another, another situation where... Dashing Pacific Group LTD, which has already purchased the nearby dock restaurant complex for $2.15 million, put its $3.8 million offer to buy the southern 69 acres at the Marina District. <laughs> so, should we be alarmed that the Chinese are buying up pieces of America? Well, if they simply wanted to enjoy living in America and wanted to integrate into the wider community, that would be one thing. But it's another thing altogether to start dropping slices of communist China inside U.S. territory. In a previous article entitled, China Wants to Construct a 50-Square-Mile Self-Sustaining City South of Boise, Idaho, I discussed a potential deal that Sinomac, a company controlled by the Chinese government, was exploring with the government of Idaho. The following is a description of that potential project from an article in the Idaho Statement. Statesman. A Chinese national company is interested in developing a 10,000 to 30,000 acre technology zone for industry, retail centers, and homes south of the Boise Air Airport. There was talk that this technology zone would be modeled after the special economic zones that have been developed in China. The city of Shenzhen is perhaps the most famous example of this. Fortunately, that deal appears to have stalled, but other mammoth deals have been moving forward in other parts of the country. For example, the Chinese have been very busy gobbling up oil and gas fields. <laughs> oh, man, I'd rather see our oil fields and gas fields nationalized, and I'm not for nationalization because it's kind of the first step, in store, step towards uh, socialization, which is really uh, socialization. The next step comes communism totalitarian government so <laughs> anyhow the Chinese have been busy gobbling up oil and gas fields the following is a quote from a local Texas news source saying state-owned Chinese energy giant CNOOC I don't know what that acronym stands for but they're buying a multi-billion dollar stake in 600,000 acres of South Texas oil and gas fields potentially testing the political waters for further expansion into US energy reserves you know that's great because I, I mean and I was being facetious when I said that it's not great to clarify it is not great because if they do not abide by our rules and regulations, I mean, what about workers' rights? Uh, how is how are our grievances to be addressed when it's like, no, we've got Chinese sovereignty on our land here? You can read more about that particular article, but the answer to the question is obvious. Sadly, the examples noted above are not isolated incidences. The truth is that the Chinese have been snapping up real estate and business assets all over America. As a recent Forbes article explains, this is from Forbes. According to a recent report in the New York Times, investors from China are now snapping up luxury apartments and are planning to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on commercial and residential projects like Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn. Chinese companies also have signed major leases at the Empire State Building and at uh, the World Trade Center, the report said. So get ready. The Chinese are buying up U.S. land and they're moving in whether you like it or not. So what will the long-term consequences be of allowing a communist superpower to buy up large sections of America? Eh, that's a good question, and we're going to stay on top of this topic to uh, find out. 
I'm Michael Wordsworth. You're listening to Breaking Down the News. If uh, you have any comments, please call in 414-935-2951. It's a little slow on this Friday, and I can't blame people. It's beautiful out there. They're getting off work. They're going to have food, heading, hitting up the bars, or just rushing home quick to get changed, showered, and maybe see that special someone tonight. So... Maybe this ain't the greatest time to call in, but you know what? If you are out there and you are listening, just call in and say, hey, Michael, yeah, I I agree. appreciate the show. Even that would help. (laughs) All right. We're going to take a little break here. Uh, I'm Michael Wordsworth. This is Breaking Down the News. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. Breaking Down the News is a community-supported RiverWestRadio.com broadcast. We're here on this Friday, May 11th, 2012 edition. I'm Michael Wordsworth. The phone lines are open, but we're going to actually take a break in a second here. I'm going to play the FBI interview one more time so it gives me a chance to rest my chops. The reason being is it's 4.52 p.m. on Friday, and I'm actually going till 6 o'clock today. I'm just not going to shut up today until it's uh, they kick me off the air. There's so much news to go over, so many interviews. I wanted to play a, an interview with Charlie Daniels. I don't know if any of you guys know who Charlie Daniels is. My mother didn't until I reminded her. I believe he did the Devil Went Down to Georgia song, uh, looking for a soul to steal and a buying way behind, willing to make a deal. That 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 guy. Actually, he's uh, very old now and very, very wise. And uh, I heard a recent interview of him talking. It was really touching. I mean, the guy's a, a real American. You know who else is a real good, a real American? Willie Nelson. <laughs> you gotta give it to this guy. Very, very active, very informed. He goes around the country. Hopefully you've caught his shows. I mean, just because, unlike some musicians that get older and get burnt out, like, uh, what's, what's, what's that poor guy's name? Um, I can't even remember. The big folk singer. Um, <laughs> Bob Dylan. There you go. Bob Dylan. I mean, Everybody loves and respects his his older stuff, but I heard his recent shows just really aren't doing it anymore. But that's not the case with Charlie Daniels and Willie Nelson. These guys are strong, healthy, and they're kicking hard, and they're very active and very concerned. And uh, if I play that interview, you definitely would hear what I'm talking about. It was quite inspiring. So like I said, I am going to take a little break. Uh, Actually, it will be... A four-minute break. I'm going to have to play the FBI interview again because I just don't have any uh, any more material to put up. But uh, if you haven't heard it, it's uh, it's all right. It's really good. It's kind of cute. And uh, if you have, well, just bear with me. I need to grab another coffee refill. Coffee is what keeps me going here. It keeps me gabbing. And uh, we will be right back. So the time is 4.54 right now. I should see you close to the hour of 5 o'clock. I'm Michael Wordsworth. Enjoy my interview. The FBI headquarters is a huge modern building in the middle of downtown. Cars and trucks drive past the front entrance on this very active street, and these doors will lead us to the elevators that will take us to the office of Deputy Director Hank Polarank. Welcome to the FBI headquarters. Can I help you? Yes, I have an appointment with Deputy Director Polarank. And your name is? Michael Wordsworth from RiverWestRadios.com, breaking down the news show. Michael who? No, no. The sorry, staff at the FBI was professional here, and courteous as they yeah, greeted me. And after a few security way. complications were smoothed out, I was soon uh, able to get Deputy in to Polarank. do my interview. I'm Michael Wordsworth from Breaking Down the News. 
Hey, come on in, take a seat. And it was an interesting interview. How many terrorist plots has the FBI foiled in the last few years? Uh, we've been busy, very busy with ongoing investigations. It's hard to say off the top of my head. Ten, maybe twelve? And out of those ten or twelve incidents, how many of those were not terrorist plots instigated by the FBI? Oh, uh, none, actually. Not one. Well, the underwear bomber, that wasn't us. But it came to light that the underwear bomber was forced onto the plane by a well-dressed man, and he didn't go through security. That wasn't the FBI. Uh, no. Might have been Secret Service. I think they handled that one. I'd like to quote an article from the New York Times, can I? Uh, sure, go ahead. This is an article by David K. Shipler, published April 29, 2012, and I quote, But all these dramas were facilitated by the FBI, whose undercover agents and informers posed as terrorists offering a dummy missile, fake C-4 explosives, a disarmed suicide vest, and rudimentary training. Suspects naively played their parts until they were arrested. When an Oregon college student, Mohammed Osman Mohammed, thought of using a car bomb to attack a festive Christmas tree lighting ceremony in Portland, the FBI provided a van loaded with 55-gallon drums of inert material, harmless blasting caps, a detonator cord, and a gallon of diesel fuel to make the van smell flammable. An undercover FBI agent even did the driving, with Mr. Muhammad in the passenger seat. Yeah. To trigger the bomb, the student punched a number into a cell phone and got no boom, only a bust. Terror. What do you say to that? What's your point? My point is it sounds like we really don't have a terrorism problem in America beyond those plots the FBI makes up itself. What? How did you get in here? Agent Smith. Be right in. What is it, sir? Hey, wait, how did you get in here? I, I don't believe this. He doesn't have clearance, sir. You'll have to come with me. He doesn't have clearance? How did he get past you? He snuck in here when I went to pay for the pizza delivery. I, I was there for a while. I wanted exact change. Okay, hey, thanks for the interview. That's all I need now. Sir, stop. Come back here. He doesn't have clearance? Thank you. Talk soon. You guys take care. Security, we have a gate jumper headed for the elevator. And whereas this interview did not yield all the answers I wanted, I did get to state my point. And as I was leaving the FBI building, I had the realization that making my point was worth the trip. Okay, we're back. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your patience on this. I know there was a little bit of dead air, but what are you going to do? I'm Michael Wordsworth. This is Broadcast News uh, being read to you by me, covering the issues that aren't covered in the mainstream media. This is important. This is crucial, and we're going over today why that is. So again, the number to call, 414-935-2951, if you have any comments on any of these topics that we were talking about. I mentioned um, that we were going to go over uh, the book by Rosa Quar. hope I'm pronouncing it right. Her last name is spelled K-O-I-R-E, and I'm going to find out how to pronounce her name. I'm reading her book right now. It's one of the best ones that I found called Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21. <laughs> Rosa Quora, she is a forensic commercial real estate appraiser specializing in eminent domain evaluation. And her nearly 30 years of experience analyzing land use and property value 
enabled her to recognize the planning revolution sweeping the nation. While fighting to stop a huge redevelopment project in her city, she researched the corporate, political, and financial interests behind it and found UN Agenda 21. Rosa speaks across the nation and is a regular blogger on her website, Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com. Now, I love this topic because it is one of the few topics that actually points out that there is a global takeover. There is an agenda to make a one world government, one world currency, to impoverish the industrialized nation, first to de industrialize the industrialized nations. I mean, how's that working out for us so far here? Our jobs, we were first told that we were going to go from a manufacturing to a service economy, and we shut down factories and industries here where we have EPA regulations and sent them over to China where we have no EPA regulations. For every like one bag of trash you throw away here, China has to throw away 40 to 60 bags of trash just to manufacture that. And when you get a radio that comes to you at Walmart and it's $5 sitting on the shelf, you often wondered, how can you sell a radio for $5 brand new on the shelf? I mean, where does this stuff come from that it's so cheap? Well, where does it come from? The costs are externalized. It's called externalized costs. That actually the pollution, the garbage dumping, and our job loss all made that possible to bring you that $5 radio. I mean, do we need a $5 radio? I mean, I'd be much happier paying for quality stuff made here that I know was providing jobs in America and many out there have the opinion oh it's globalization it's the new trend it's, it's what's happening you can't it's good for our economy you know it is good if say for instance you over here and you're manufacturing a lot of people did this in the 80s and 90s and uh, 2000 if you have a company and, and you're manufacturing over here and selling over here at, at the top prices, um, you know, you might be inclined to go, wait, what? I, I can manufacture the same items for only 10, 20 percent of the cost that it would it would cost here in terms of if you run a company, you'll find that your biggest overhead are your employees, unless you're like some megalithic corporation with all this in infrastructure in place. You'll find that, like, for most small businesses, it's the employee cost that, that really bring you down. So sending it over to China, uh, it didn't help us here. And basically what happened was we thought that our dollar was strong because as the dollar weakened in value, we were able to be, buy this cheap, poisonous Chinese crap. And we thought, oh, well, we're doing pretty good. But did you notice many of us lost our jobs? There was a price to pay. And the reason that this all happened in the first place is because there is a elite global cabal. A cabal is a group of guys or women that organize in secret to do generally nefarious schemes. Nefarious being uh, evil, wicked, nasty schemes. So where did the UN agenda come from? How did it start? Why is it there? And where is it in our communities? I described it earlier as this big green icky monster with thousands of tentacles reaching into our communities and wrapping themselves around the throats of our city council members. Um, it's insidious the way that they push this agenda because they use a technique called the Delphi technique. It actually invites people to participate in local town meetings, town, town hall meetings, and basically the agenda is already decided when they get in there. What, what, how they're going to vote for this. The trick through using the Delphi technique is to make us, the citizens, think that we actually arrived at this decision and conclusion ourselves, which is what makes it so insidious. You, you are not going to be convinced that you're a slave, that you're oppressed, if you think you're free. We, we say it's a free country. First off, there's nothing free in this country. Everything costs money. Uh, your freedoms that you did possess for many generations since 1776, those freedoms, liberties, and rights were fought after by labor organizing into unions 
against strike breakers, um, against revolutionaries throwing off the oppressive shackles of Britain's tyranny, where King George was saying, no, you got to pay these taxes and those taxes. We started an idea here that really just shook the world and set a new premise. And many countries respected us for our Constitution and Bill of Rights. It did strong. We built a, a strong middle class bought own our own homes, were able to send our kids to colleges, but we went from a savings-based um, na nation to a debtor nation. Many of us have lost our wealth, and the great wealth coming for the middle class is found in your properties, and that's why this UN Agenda 21 is should be a concern to you. The, the UN Agenda uh, got started in the 70s, but it got its real start in 1992 at the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro when President Bush signed onto it along with the leaders of 178 other countries. Because it is what's known as a soft law, it did not have to be ratified by the Congress. The following year, President Clinton began to implement it by creating the President's Council on Sustainable Development made up of cabinet-level government officials, captains of industry, including Ken Lay of Enron. Oh, boy. Whenever you have captains of industry and you put together a cabinet of, of government officials and you include Ken Lay of Enron in that, in that that's like inviting um, uh, Al Capone to monitor and regulate Prohibition. Ken Lay, if those of you that don't know, he was one of the, him and uh, Skilling, they were the smartest guys in the room. Oh, everybody herald, oh, you guys are great. You're so smart. You know, they were smart, but only at fooling other people, only at robbing them. And the state of California suffered a lot of power outages that were caused intentionally. If you listen to the go go see, in fact there's a movie Enron it's called uh, the smartest guys in the room I believe the movie really woke me up to the subject because back when that came out I was not aware of it I had no idea like like most Americans I was just living my life unaware of these issues creeping up around me and slowly I wanted to know why was life getting worse and worse in America what was happening to our jobs infra infrastructure and industry. And never quite knew. And, and now we find out, well, these things aren't happening accidentally. This isn't just a case that the rich people are doing what they always did, which is being good at being rich and using their massive amount of money and power to influence industry and trade. Hey, you could kind of expect that. It's never a level playing field, but this is a different situation because the playing field, although never level, this isn't even a playing field anymore. It's the illusion that you can play on this field. Um, you're not going to get out of your social ranks and financial position without financial mobility. And your financial mobility is being narrowed each and every day that legislations and agendas like this UN21 are creeping up around us. So anyhow, they, uh, the... President's Council on Sustainable Development, made up of cabinet-level government officials, including Ken Lay of Enron, and nonprofit groups such as the Sierra Club. One of the first tasks of the PCSD, which is the President's Council on Sustainable Development, the first task was to give a multi-million dollar grant to the American Planning Association to design a legislative guidebook to be used as a blueprint for every city county and state in the United States in order to implement UN Agenda 21. This document called Growing Smart Legislative Guidebook, Model Statutes for Planning and the Management of Change, took seven years to complete and a full nine years to arrive at the final version. The guidebook, and it's not just a guidebook but a blueprint, contains sample legislation, ordinances, rules, regulations, and statutes to be incorporated into the general plans of every single city and country, pardon, every single city and county in the United States. 
By 2002, every planning department and every local, state, and federal department that governs land use had a copy and was implementing the practices. Every university, every college, every junior college, private school and teaching institution in our nation was growing, uh, pardon me, was using a, a program called Growing Smart in its curriculum. Growing Smart, sound familiar? Growing Smart is smart growth. These are key buzzwords, smart growth, sustainability, the green movement, we all feel good, vague, ambiguous terms that actually obfuscate the true agenda behind them. So a non-governmental organization called the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, which they have the ICLEI, which is the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives is tasked with carrying out the goals of UN Agenda 21 locally. Over 600 cities and counties in the U.S. are members. The costs are paid by taxpayers. Okay, you say, interesting, but I don't see how that really affects me. Well, here's a few ways. No matter where you live, I'll bet there have been hundreds of condos built or planned in the center of your town recently. Over the last 10 years, there's been a planning revolution across the U.S. It was the implementation of Growing Smart. Your commercial, industrial, and multi-residential land was rezoned to mixed use. And when that gets rezoned, that's your aldermen. I mean, this is the thing, is the older, older men, older women actually hold a key pivotal role in this. And getting behind your local representatives makes a difference in your locality. It really does. Because they can't pass this. They, just, they can't come along and say, ah, you have no rights, no land, no nothing. Uh, it's done, it's over. Oh, the people would revolt. They're eventually going to revolt, but I mean, we still have some time. But they would revolt immediately. And so this has to be done very slowly, very gradually. These people are so patient. So nearly everything that got approvals for development was designed the same way. Ground floor retail with two or three stories of residential... Oh, oh. Oh, I thought we had a color, but <laughs> I guess we did it. It's the video store here. They have the same ringer, and it sounds like uh, sounds like they did. I'm reading from uh, Rosa Quara's book, Behind the Green Mask, you in Agenda 21, and she was just mentioning here how uh, that th this is how it affects you. So, I mean, uh, have you have you had condos? Uh, blowing up in your neighborhood you know you wonder is there like a mass migration of millionaires coming to buy these condos and live in them it's kind of crazy so many of them are being built and I don't get it the economy is getting worse this is not a recovery and there's not going to be uh, a bunch of people from Chicago moving up here going ah, oh, Milwaukee's the new Chicago so what's behind this we're gonna find out uh, you notice that the, these uh, this development, it's designed the same way. Ground floor retail with two or three stories of residential above, called mixed use. Very hard to finance for construction, very hard to manage since it has to have a high density of people in order to justify the retail. A lot of it is empty and most of the ground floor retail is empty too. High bankruptcy rate. So what? Hmm. Most of your town's providing Funding and or infrastructure development for these private projects. That's right. The funding came from your towns. They used redevelopment agency funds, your money, specifically your property taxes. Notice how there's very little money in your general funds now. They're always telling us, boy, we're broke, we're broke. And most of that is going to pay off the police and fire. Your streetlights are off, your parks are shaggy, your roads are potholed, and your county hospitals are closing. The money that should be used for these things is diverted into the redevelopment agency for 30 years. It's the only agency in government that can float a bond without a vote of the people. And they did that. And now you're paying off those bonds for the next 30 to 45 years with your property taxes. Did you know that? So what does this have to do with Agenda 21? 
Redevelopment is a tool used to further the Agenda 21 vision in remaking America's city. With redevelopment, cities have the right to take property by eminent domain against the will of the property owner and give it or sell it to a private developer. By declaring an area of town blighted, and in some cities, over 90% of the city area has been declared blighted, uh, broke down, impoverished, uh, almost useless. And uh, it's lost its efficacy. The property taxes in that area are diverted away from the general fund. This constriction of available funds is impoverishing the cities, forcing them to offer less and less services and reducing your standard of living. And what do they tell you? They tell the police departments, uh, we're going broke. Meanwhile, you keep getting all this federal money to fund the drug war that's being used to take over and, and stamp on First and Fourth Amendment rights, even Second Amendment rights. And uh, the, the police are just all excited. Wow, we're getting all this federal money. Look, there's no free freaking money, okay? We're paying for that. And as you're bashing in our heads for talking back to you on the street, which I don't recommend, don't talk back to a police officer. That's not my point. It's always wise to be professional and courteous, even if you find that officer being unprofessional. It does no good to be a smart-mouthed uh, hoodlum. I couldn't find the term, but... Uh, it, it does no good. I mean, we, we, we must have respect for each other. Anyhow, let me continue with this. The money gets redirected into the redevelopment agency and handed out to favored developers building low-income housing and mixed use, called smart growth. Cities have had thousands of condos built in the redevelopment areas and are telling you that you are terrible for wanting your own yard, for wanting privacy, for not wanting to be dictated to by a condo homeowners association. Oh, and, and the condo homeowners association board. Oh, boy, they're, they're like the new authorities. And, and you'll get accused of being antisocial. For not going along to get along. For not moving into a cramped, overpriced apartment downtown where they can use your property taxes for paying off that huge bond debt. But it's not working, and you don't want to move in there, so they have to make you. Here's how. Human habitation, as it is referred to now, is restricted to lands within the urban growth boundaries of the city. Only certain buildings' designs are permitted. Rural property is more and more restricted in what uses it can be on. According, although counties say that the support that they do support agricultural uses, eating locally produced food, farmers markets, that type of thing. In fact, there are so many regulations restricting water and land use. There are scenic corridors, inland rural corridors, bayland corridors, area plans, specific plans, redevelopment plans, huge fees, fines. The farmers are losing their lands altogether. County roads are not being paved. They push the push. It's for people to get off the land, become more depend dependent, not independent. Come into the cities to get out of the suburbs and into the cities, out of their private homes and into the condos. Maybe maybe that's where all the millions of uh, 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 millionaires are going to come from. They're, they're going to be kicked out of the country and forced to live in the city. Hey, what do you think of that, people out in the rural areas? <laughs> it's coming. Listen to what I'm saying, and then you'll see it as it happens. You'll know that, hey, that guy, Michael Wordsworth, I'm breaking down the news, talking about Agenda 21. I'm seeing it happen right now before my very eyes. Everybody will be affected by this. There's no escaping it. The only thing we can do is get informed and stand up in our city councils, contact our aldermen, let them know. We're not putting up with this. Uh, and and, and no, no private cars. We're going to all have to be riding bikes. Bikes. What do, what do bikes have to do with it? I like to ride a bike and so do you. So what? Bicycle advocacy groups are very powerful now. Ah, good, good. I mean, I didn't know bicyclists needed advocacy, but whatever. Don't you just get on your bike and ride the bike? But we need advocacy now. A fancy word for lobbying, influencing, and maybe strong-arming the public and politicians. What's the connection with bike groups? National groups such as Complete Streets, Thunderhead Alliance and others have training programs teaching their members how to pressure for redevelopment and training candidates for office. It's not just about bike lanes. It's about remaking cities and rural areas to the sustainable model. 
High density urban development without parking for cars is the goal. They call them transit villages. Isn't that a nice term, transit villages? This means that, you know, all the NPR listeners, you, don't, you, don't you like those terms? Transit villages, sustainability. Oh, yes, the evil SUV driving people using gas. And it's horrible. I should just key their cars. We should all be riding bicycles and living in huts and in the city and get out of the country. It scares me. Sorry, I'm making fun of that. I can't help it. It's just too fun. Okay, basically what this means is that the whole towns need to be demolished and rebuilt in the image of sustainable development. Bike groups. Now, I'm not saying bike groups are evil, but this is this is how it's done. These bike groups, often denominated by testosterone-laden zealots, are being used as the shock troops for this plan. What plan? We're losing our homes since this recession depression began and many of us could never afford those homes to begin with we got cheap money used whatever we had to squeak into those homes and now some of us lost some of us lost them we were lured indebted and sunk whole neighborhoods are empty in some places some are being bulldozed cities cannot afford to extend services outside their core areas slowly people will not be able to afford single family homes we will not be able to afford private cars will be more dependent more restricted more easily watched and monitored this plan is a whole life plan it involves the educational system the energy market the transportation system the governmental system the health care system food production and more i told you it's complicated that's why I really just I wanted to touch on this an introduction to Agenda 21 because it is so complicated. The best way to imagine it is that that big icky green monster with its tentacles reaching into every aspect of your life, food, energy, housing, farming. It's a plan to inventory and control all of the natural resources, means of production, and human beings in the world, period. The plan is to restrict your choices. Limit your funds, narrow your freedoms, and take away your voice. One of the ways is by using the Delphi technique to manufacture consensus. I mentioned the Delphi technique earlier. And another is to infiltrate the community groups or actually start neighborhood associations with hand-picked leaders. <laughs> the ones that will go along with the agenda. They're hand-picked and they're said, oh, go out and convince the other mammalians that this is okay. And another is to groom and train future candidates for local offices. This is not what we, we do not need this. We do not need new candidates that become representatives of some UN agenda that basically wants to take away. And no, 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 no. If they do it, they might get away with this. And yet another is to sponsor non-governmental groups that go into schools and train children. And while still another arm of this agenda is to offer federal and private grants and funding for local programs that further the agenda, another still is to educate a new generation of land use planners to require new urbanism. Ooh, that's a nice key buzzword, new urbanism. It must be better than old urbanism. I mean, I don't want to be unfashionable. I I want to stay up on the latest fashions and trends and let everybody know that I spend my money. Anyhow. I digress, and yet another insidious tentacle emanating from Agenda 21 is to convert factories to other uses. Introduce energy measures that penalize manufacturing and set energy consumption goals to pre-1985 levels. And the last tentacle is to allow unregulated immigration in order to lower standards of living and drain local resources. Everything that has happened was meant to happen by your government. Let's dig a little deeper into this topic. I'm Michael Wordsworth. You're listening to Breaking Down the News. The number to call in if you're uh, finding what I'm talking about alarming, it's 414-935-2951. I'm reading uh, to you today from a, a book called... Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21. Agenda 21 is something you will be dealing with. There's no way around it. Economic collapse creates a chain of events. 
But on a micro level, county and city, there is marked reduction in revenue for maintenance of services. Loss of services to outlying areas means, for example, roads not being maintained to rural and suburban areas. Roads not being maintained to those areas. Schools not being supported in those areas. Law enforcement, fire, social, social services not being supported in those areas means a gradual movement into the denser city centers. And to that, the increased cost of gasoline, which is manipulated, and the higher cost of energy, also manipulated, to heat and cool statistically larger homes, and you have more pressure to leave rural and suburban areas. Reduction of energy usage is key. Uh, it's, it's key to their agenda. It's not key to, I mean, it's nice to turn off your lights and everything, but there's no, we're already living like peasants. This is the, the lowest I want to go in terms of peasant poverty. I don't need uh, energy restricted. Well, Al Gore takes private freaking jets all over the place and actually owns an oil company or at least the interest in a major controlling interest in the oil company, and he owns the major controlling interest in the carbon credit cap and trade scam. What? You didn't know that? Yes, yes. El Gore, the, I think that polar bears can't swim, and global warming is destroying the planet. The only way we can fight this is by... Not me stopping my flights and owning eight mansions across the world. No, no, no. You peasants need to turn down your heat and stop taking so many hot showers. Ah, sorry, I don't do a good Al Gore impression, but I mean, um, when you find out about this guy and you find out how he's really deceived us, you'll feel the same indignation I do towards him. It's disgusting. So here we go. Redevelopment areas is the supposed answer. Smaller units, attached condos, little or no parking, few private cars, more eyes on the street. Redevelopment projects are one implementation arm of the UN plan and including rezoning of huge sections of your cities to growth, smart growth zones. That's what they call them, smart growth zones. This physical manifestation of UN Agenda 21 is social engineering. Social engineering, paid for with your property tax dollars. Uh, if I were to break that down, what is social engineering paid for with your property tax dollars? Uh, basically, you're paying to have your mind decided for you. You're paying to have somebody else tell you what is right. Uh, maybe you feel that you can't decide what's right and you need to trust the experts. Hey, where have the experts been leading you? For the last three decades, <laughs> where are these uh, Alan Greenspan, uh, expert on finance, and guys were revered as a god of finance, and he, he uh, basically all he managed to do is convince us that bubble-driven economies are the only way to go. And where did those bubble-driven economies get us? Right here. This is what we're experiencing today. The bubbles keep popping. It's not a good idea. These areas then have their property taxes diverted away from your services and into the pockets of a few developers and bond brokers for decades. The result? Bankrupt cities and counties. It's happening all over America right now. Ghost towns. It's so sad to see. It really, really is. In addition to these factors, ecologically motivated regulation makes rural suburban development prohibitive. From stream, creek, ditch protection to watershed protection to bayland, inland, rural corridor prohibitions to increased species protection, the list of growings. The use of land is greatly limited. Look, I'm not against uh, protecting species. I'm not against not polluting. In fact, I, I, I think you should get the death penalty if for, for one thing and one thing only. I would allow the death penalty after we've... Uh, in a civil manner, um, gave gave a company a trial and found them to be guilty. If you poison Lake Michigan's water, you're in an industrial environmental terrorist. It happens all the time. It's funny, and you you just don't see the public protesting this kind of thing. And what what you do see is a small business comes along. They cannot meet. The, they just want to play like the big guys. This is what I mean. It's like the playing field's never level. But in this case, it's not even a playing field. Uh, the big corporations get exempted. 
Um, for example, the new Obama's mandatory health care, where you're going to be paying for your health care insurance from now on. If you don't pay it, you're going to get deducted, deducted $1,600 out of your taxes to pay for it. And guess who's exempt uh, from, from this requirement? Um, Walmart, McDonald's, a few other big corporations that employ people part-time. That's the technicality. If you're a small business, though, and, and look, we're having a struggling economy. Anyway, whether you think there's a recovery or not, the economy is struggling. You would want people, small businesses. I mean, big business only makes up 20%. It used to be 80% were small business. I think that those statistics have got to have changed by now. But you want people to provide jobs. Are, are you, they going to be able to hire you if they have to pay for your health care insurance? No. Do the big companies have to pay for it? Uh-uh. Walmart? No. McDonald's? No. You're part-time. Try raising a family on that. It's just not, not possible. Now, add to this the pressure from the ICLEI climate protection campaigns to reduce your energy usage to pre-1985 levels. <clears throat> I wish they'd, they'd reduce my prices to pre-1985 levels. That'd be, that'd be great. I mean, food and fuel has gone up greatly since the 80s. And when they do the CPI, core inflation projection, they take out food and fuel out of that equation now. So they tell you, no, there's been no inflation. But you know you're paying more at the grocery store. You know you're paying more for your water, your heat. In fact, the laundromat down the street, they were like a buck seventy-five. They went up to like two dollars and then two fifty a wash. And I, I talked to the, the owner, very nice guy, and I said, "Why the increase?" He said, "Water rates went up." I was like, "Ah, but why did water rates go up?" Well, because somebody else is controlling them. That's usually what you find when these rates increase. They become privatized. You've lost control of your municipalities. They're now going to somewhere else. Now, look, you can't grow enough food to do more than provide a minor supplement to your purchased food, and most people are not farmers. Dedication, knowledge, inexpensive water, good quality soil, not contaminated with lead, as is mostly the case in urban soil, and sufficient land to provide economies of scale are required to provide food. Otherwise, you're just plain. As the population becomes more and more urbanized and less able to provide food or necessary products, more people will be dependent on the government for housing, food, and other basic necessities. It's called the nanny state, when you rely on the government for everything. We used to not have any of Government itself becomes dependent on grants and loans with requirements attached. In this way, policymakers are influenced and pressured by the corporatocracy. Public-private partnerships favor some businesses over others and completely unbalance the playing field. Independent businesses go bankrupt. Poverty works its way into the middle class. All right, I'm Michael Wordsworth. This is Breaking Down the Nose. I'd like to invite you to call in at any point. Again, the number is 414-935-2951. I'm sort of going on a marathon here today until 6 o'clock. It's 5.33 p.m. right now. Actually, I do hope you are out there enjoying this beautiful weather because it just, it, it is gorgeous. I'm looking outside the window. I'm broadcasting live from the video store next to Fuel Cafe on Center Street. And <laughs> people are, they're wearing shorts and they're just relaxed and enjoying this all. and that's really good to see it really really is so if you get a chance I hope later you checked out the show on our archives list of course if you do watch it through the archives you can't call in because I won't be here obviously so I'm going to keep reading though because I want you to be informed this is a serious issue you and Agenda 21 and I'm not going to give up on this topic until people are informed here we go social equity social equity another cornerstone of agenda 21 comes in here as a major leveler the loss of money land food and energy independence will bring the u.s into social equ equity with the poorer countries <laughs> i love that let's bring us that's what globalization is is we're just going to take our nice jobs and our nice wealth, wealth of the middle class and we're going to uh uh be on par with the, the Chinese and the uh, less industrialized nations. <laughs> this is something. 
this is a goal of, of Agenda 21. In 1976, the UN Conference on Human S Settlements, Habitat One, stated in its preamble that private land ownership is also a principal instrument of acum accumulation and concentration of wealth, and therefore contributes to social injustice. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. Think about the implications of that. That when we're discussing eminent domain, land use restrictions, and conservation easements, you might have thought that social equity would mean that the poor would be raised up. Nope. There are elements of the social equity concept that block the development of dirty industry or anything that would be bad for the community in a low income area. Low income areas should not be viewed as a dumping ground for pollution. Yes, I agree. So do you probably. But it's the green mask. Behind that is the removal of all industry from all areas. The only thing being built in low income areas is low income housing with redevelopment funds. Warehousing of the poor is the result. Health will suffer. Presumably, health care will suffer. And nutrition will suffer. Psychological problems, stress from living in the tight, smart growth areas with other un- or underemployed people, and crime will result. Community-oriented policing under the Department of Justice will encourage, if not require, people to watch their neighbors and report suspicious activity. More actively will be identified as crime, such as, and they're not talking about car thefts, break-ins, drug dealing. They're talking about, get this, obesity, smoking, drinking when you have a drinking problem, name-calling, leaving lights on. Mm, oh, you left lights on. So, geez. Neglect in someone's per perception of children. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I'm not talking about actual parental neglect. I'm talking about somebody uh, leaves their child unattended in the backyard for two minutes while they go answer the phone and deal with maybe uh, some other issue, and the neighbor, the nosy neighbor, comes out and says, oh, that child has been neglected. I need to report this. Uh, you know what? In Nazi Germany, you want to know how they took over people? The, the, the secret police that they had there, the Gestapo, they didn't have to personally watch and observe everybody. They relied on neighbors to narc out other neighbors. And you, you know what? That's going to happen in this country. It's already happening right now. We're such little narcs. We like to narc out everybody. I, I, I saw some injustice happening. You know what? Deal with your own injustice. If you can't do good, just try to refrain from doing evil. I mean, that's the least you can do. If you can't do good, do no harm. And yeah, I, I'm going off on this because it's describing how this is how this agenda is going to be going to be uh, under the guise of oh, we're, we're report suspicious activity, uh, activity like being overweight, smoking, drinking when you have a drinking problem. You know, just look at Milwaukee. Everybody, everybody drinks. And it, it's like socially acceptable to be a drunk. This will be interesting because, <laughs> anyhow. So uh, what, what are the other great crimes that they're calling? Name calling, leaving lights on, uh, negligence of children, or oh, negligence of elderly and pets. Driving, driving, when you could be riding a bike. Could you imagine that? You know, my neighbor, I, I, I just like to call and report that my neighbor, he, he, he has a bicycle, but he drove his car today. I, I don't know if he needs to pick up groceries and then run a few errands for his children before he picks them up for school. But all I know is that he left his bicycle here and he's driving around right now in a car. Are you serious? Really? Hmm. The community will demand more law enforcement to restore order. And more rules and regulations will ensue. The lines between government and non-governmental groups will blur more and more as unelected local groups make policy, policy decisions using the Delphi technique to manufacture consensus. The Chinese and Russian models are instructive in what you can expect under communitarianism. Read Nian Cheng's Life and Death in Shanghai. 
read that. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn's, there we go, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, Archipelago, for real world examples. The War on Terror is a communitarian plan designed to terrorize you, the independent, red-blooded American citizen. You can see that the groundwork for this has been laid and has been implemented throughout the nation. When you create deep dependence and then withdraw assistance, the result is chaos and poverty. Propaganda infuses our culture with messages that there are just a few winners and many losers. That we are killing the earth and time is running out. That prosperity is an anachronism and detrimental to life. It, 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 you know, if prosperity ever becomes an anachronism and detrimental to life, we would be in some deep problems. That individual freedom is selfish and injures those who are less free. Hmm. These messages are crafted to shame and pressure you to create a sense of urgency that impairs your ability to reason clearly. All right, in the beginning, although there are even earlier indications that the United Nations sought to control land use and manage populations, such as the 1976 Habitat One, the precursor to the 1992 Rio Earth Summit was a similar meeting of the same commission in 1987. The World Commission on Environment and De Development called the Brundtland Commission that initially defined the term sustainable development in its Our Common Future report to the United Nations. The Brundtland Commission defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Well, doesn't that sound good? I mean, that sounds reasonable. It always sounds reasonable, but that's how they sling this crap. All that remains was to, was to state that our current activities and means of living were compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs and then decide what to do about it. After our common future was presented to the UN General Assembly, General Assembly in 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development, the Brundtland Commission, was tasked with designing strategies for achieving sustainable development by the year 2000. At the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, the commission, which was chaired by Maurice Strong, came back with the action plan Agenda 21. There is no aspect of our lives that is not covered by this document. The 40 chapters are divided into four sections. Section 1 being social and economic dimensions. Section 2, conservation and management of resources for development. And Section 3, strengthening the role of major groups. Section 4, the means of implementation. In other words, how are they going to... How are they going to uh, get this actually implemented? You can read it yourself in the United Nations website. Just put in UN Agenda 21 in a search engine. Some of the most important information can be found in Chapter 7, Human Settlements, which is the foundation for sustainable communities, and in the last chapter where the technology and methods for impl implementation are discussed. The phil philosophical basis for much of UN Agenda 21 legislation and regulation is the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle. It's from the 1992 Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit and it's principle 15. The definition of principle 15? Here you go. The precautionary principle states that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking the action. It's sort of a guilty until proven innocent thing. Calling it a principle makes it a source of law in the European Union. A fun fact is that the EU hasn't formally defined it, but they use it to craft their laws on food, technological development, trade, environmental and consumer protections. It is compulsory. 
Here in the U.S., we call it the precautionary approach so as to not codify it as law. It's the color of law. It's not actual law, kind of like children, like uh, Rick Perry in Texas saying that children have to take vaccinations. They have to be guarded against Gardasil. And the, 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 I forgot how many girls died from that. And uh, he said the, the, the schools tell you it's the law. You know what? It's not the law. The law is the law. When you break the law, that's one thing. You would be understood about being you know, arrested or brought up on charges. But when your officials tell you that something is a law but it isn't, uh, we've crossed into a new sick territory that you have to be a, a moron in complete denial to put up with it. So... Uh, here in the U.S., we call the precautionary approach so as to not codify it as law, but it is still being used to develop policy. How do you like that? In the absence of proof that something is harmful, you're supposed to prove that it isn't. This is serious. Think about climate change, global warming, or species impacts. All right, let's bring it on home. William Clinton, Bill Clinton, and we all remember him was elected president in November 1992, and six months later, he issued Executive Order Number 12852. Type that into Google. Executive Order Number 12852, which created the President's Council on Sustainable Development, the PCSD. <laughs> it first met in the summer of 1993 and continued until 1999. The members of the PA PCSD included cabinet secretaries for transportation, agricultural education, commerce, housing and authority and urban development, environmental protection agency, small business and administration, energy, interior and defense, representing businesses for CEOs for Pacific Gas and Electric, Enron's Ken Lay, BP Amico and Dow Chemical among others. All right, well, it's 546, and it is a beautiful Friday uh, afternoon, approaching evening here. It looks like I got got my uh, word in today, but we're going to have to wrap this up because we have uh, some more shows coming up on the air. Appreciate your participation in the show. I'm not really sure how many people out there were listening today, but um, I uh, always appreciate tuning in and checking out the archives list. I'm going to leave with this long Wordsworth intro and um, my new intro that I made for the show. This is the extended version. I usually play the short version, but I'd just like to say, take care of yourselves. I look forward to talking to you on Monday. Please, I hope there's more callers. Uh, maybe if it's <laughs> worse weather, we'll have more callers. I don't know. Anyhow, I am Michael Wordsworth. This is Breaking Down the News, and I leave you with this. Take care. You know why you're here, Mr. Wordsworth? Yes, sir. I'd ask you to speak up a little, if you will. Yes, sir. I know why I am here. You've been under investigation, Mr. Wordsworth, for the mandatory period of one year and 11 months. You are found to be obsolete. The purpose of this hearing is to make a finding in the matter and make a sentence accordingly. Do you understand that? I understand that. Your occupation, Mr. Wordsworth? A radio talk show host. A radio talk show host, sir. I'm told you've had counsel and been given orientation, Mr. Wordsworth, but I'm still not sure in my own mind that you understand the purpose of this hearing. The field investigators in your sector have classified you as obsolete. This finding carries with it serious implications. Do you understand that, Mr. Wordsworth? Now I ask you again your occupation. I am a radio talk show host. That is my occupation, my profession. If you people choose to call that obsolete... Request clarification of the term? Yes, the term. Uh, Mr. Wordsworth, you people, you make reference to the state. I make reference to the state. And you persist in declaring your occupation, correct? That is correct. A minister. A minister would tell us that his function is that of preaching the word of God. And of course it follows that since the state has proven that there is no God, that would make the function of a minister somewhat academic as well. There is a God. You are in error, Mr. Wordsworth. There is no God. The state has proven that there is no God. You cannot erase God with an edict. You are obsolete, Mr. Wordsworth.
have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth, a crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature who has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. I exist. <laughs>